Love this podcast? Support it and sponsor today. Simply head to OzCastNetwork.com for details. It's The In Show, Australia's only show dedicated to innovation from Adelaide, Australia and across the globe. It's David Grice and Troy Sincock. Happy New Year. We are talking innovation once again and it's interview time today. I'm interviewing you, David. Oh, dear. I'm, uh, you know, I've got no fingernails left. I'm getting a bit nervous <laughs> overnight. Well, we thought it's a new year and uh, it's about time you knew a little bit more about us. Um, because I was the scaredy cat, I thought that you'd go first, David. And, and look, needless to say, I was the one that put the time into coming up with questions anyway. So that was the only way it was ever going to work. Well, true. And uh, you're going to get your chance on Thursday. Yeah, I'm a bit concerned about that, to be honest. Oh, you should be. Well, look, I've known David since uh, 2013 when we met in my capacity as general manager of Fresh 92.7. We decided that we needed to explore a partnership with Music SA. Just so happened David was general manager of that organisation. Um, but what I've come to learn is the story was very interesting up until that point. So, David, things began with music with you. Well, actually, I am told by my father that I could sing words before I could speak them. So um, as a child, I was singing all the time, and that turned into my dad giving me the opportunity to sing on a children's musical. He was a Baptist music pastor, and uh, and so I got to sing on a kid's musical in the studio at age six and told dad that that's what I was going to do for the rest of my life. And it came close to becoming that way for you too. You got a, um, you got a record contract at a very young age. Yeah, I was uh, 19 when, mm-hmm. when that happened. Um, I got signed by a record label out of Nashville or mm-hmm. just out of Nashville uh, in a little town called Knoxville. And they were called Mercy Street Records and, and my band Big Noise got signed and I was going to, you know, have a life of you know, international superstardom, so yeah. I thought. Yeah, exactly as you declared to your dad all those years ago. So how did that go for you? When I told dad that, you know, I was going to do music for the rest of my life, my dad told me, you've got to get a real job, son. If you, you know, if you're going to do that music thing, you've got to get a real job. Now, this is coming from a music pastor. So he mm-hmm. had music as part of his life, you know, all through his career. Sure. But for me, yep. So I got to midway through school and uh, year 10, year 11, thought school wasn't for me. It wasn't teaching me how to be a rock star. That's all I wanted to be. And I told Dad I was going to leave, and he told me I've got to get a job. So I did a carpentry apprenticeship. I was kind of, you know, handy with my hands. I loved tinkering around in Dad's shed and building things and stuff. And, and um, yeah, by the time I'd finished my carpentry apprenticeship, a month later I was on a plane to America. Yeah, so how did that work out, uh, going to Nashville? What type of music were you making, and did your career go the way you expected? Yeah, it was a pop rock sort of thing. Okay. Um, I, I guess back then we didn't have email or we didn't have any other means of communication except for normal mail. So what year are we talking? So we're talking uh, the late 80s. Mm-hmm. And um, and so what happened was uh, I just decided to get on a plane and go to America and knock on the doors. I'd, I'd made all these appointments, you know, the months leading up to the time I went and uh, just met all these people, looked at all these studios, uh, lobbed in Nashville for two weeks and absolutely loved it. And... Yep, the opportunity came while I was there and, you know, came home with a record deal in my hand. I mean, that's what most kids aspire to. Like, you would have thought that, you you know, your dream had begun. Well, I did, and, and it was one of those sort of surreal experiences. And, and all in the midst of all of that, I was getting this record deal and, and it was all very exciting. And on my way home from America, because I was coming home to sort of get set to go back again, I got word when I hit New Zealand that my mum died. So it was sort of like this incredible, intense, huge emotion of, of joy that I was going to be, you know, potentially pursuing my dream, only to turn out that the, the most favourite woman in my, my life had passed away while I wasn't at home. And the last conversation I had with her was I was on an international phone call from America saying, I really need to talk to dad, you know, and she was asking me all these questions like I was getting frustrated. And so coming home to the fact that I didn't see my mum again was, was really, you know, it's a tough one. And did that change things for you? It made me more determined to succeed because I knew she wanted me to do it. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And she was really proud of, of where I was and, and, you know, what I'd actually achieved to that point. And, uh, and it, I guess it gave me that, that real determination. But, um, but what I didn't realise is that when she passed was the last time I'd actually written a song, which was really amazing. So, mm-hmm. yeah, so it was like at the time I didn't realise it, but, uh, you know, months and months as they, they sort of progressed down the track and the history unfolded, mm-hmm. yeah, it, it, it actually stopped what was driving my creativity in, in, in that moment of my life. Wow, that's, yeah, that's amazing to think that it you know, had impact far greater than 
you know, just the impact of having a, a parent die, that it actually affected your course of life so mm. dramatically. And particularly given that, you know, since the age of six, your heart had been set on this area. Like that's that's a big thing. Yeah, it is. But I guess I guess for me, you know, in, in looking back at it, my heart was set on being a musician. It didn't necessarily matter what music I was playing. Mm-hmm. And and as a result of that, it, it sort of meant that so long as it was musical, I was able to change my direction in any way, which way but loose. Like when the record deal fell over because we couldn't get working visas, I thought, oh, well, I'm not going to give up on music because I love playing so and I love entertaining people. So I came home and met this guy who was going to come over and drum with me on this ba- on, on my band and he just said, well, let's do a Beatles band. So we created a Beatles band and I – for ne- the next tech- 10 years, toured the world as Paul McCartney. <laughs> now, that is quite a left turn. Like you said, still in the same space, but this is something that you would never have fathomed. How was it going from making original music to then all of a sudden being in a, a cover band? Um, I think I think through the experience of bureaucracy stopping me fulfilling my dream, I got that frustrated with the whole original thing that I thought, you know what, I just want to make money. I'm just going to make some money. I'm going to have some fun and just see where it leads. Mm-hmm. And uh, and that's what happened. What was it like being a Beatle? I've got to tell you, it's the most satisfying and f- enjoyable gig that I have ever done. What was it about that? It was just the fact that the songs were so familiar mm-hmm. and we did a reasonable job of it. I mean, we, we really prided ourselves on the fact that we, we ripped it note for note. We, we played it the way it was played. And uh, and we had a – our John Lennon vocalist was just absolutely dead on. He was so close to John, it wasn't funny. I didn't really sound like Paul, but, you know, we did the suits, the wigs, the, you know, the, the fake pommy accents, and we just created the mayhem that was the Beatles, and, uh, and it was just such fun. And, you know, you could stop playing and people would just sing it back at you. At the height of uh, the popularity of the band – um, what were some of the craziest stuff that was happening for you personally in terms of opportunities and, and you know, the amount that you were working? Yeah, well, I mean, obviously the, the travel, we were away, you know, eight to nine months of the year if we added up all the, the away days. And so not really good for home life. But while we were out, you know, it's just understanding different cultures and, and what opportunities are there. And, you know, I, I really developed a love of being in the studio. So I decided to build my own little studio at home so that when we weren't on the road, you know, I was able to do demos for the band, demos for other bands and uh, and, and just be able to um, create a little business on the side and just, you know, support the income that, that I had from the from the band. But, I mean, you know, I think the crazy things were, were just the some of the sizes of the audiences that we played for and the insane amount of money that people would pay us just to turn up. What was the most distant place you travelled to? Probably Beijing. Mm-hmm. Um, this was soon after the Tiananmen Square incident happened that, you know, has been well documented in history. And uh, walking through Tiananmen Square and just looking at the eeriness of what, was there a few years prior to that and then just some strange things that that go on there and and we walked into this place that was like this nightclub we didn't know it was a nine o'clock in the morning we thought oh this looks like an interesting shop we go in and have a look mm-hmm. we walk in and it's a bar and there's cartoons playing on the big screen and there's like an umpa brass band playing in there as well <laughs> you know so it was really sort of interesting kind of places that we we visited but I think probably walking around Tiananmen Square and then when they took us on a tour to the Great Wall of China but we went on the part that the tourists don't go on mm-hmm. and uh, it was quite narrow and rickety in comparison and I had this little um person that followed me she was my shadow and uh, and she was a Mongolian trade like she was just wanting me to buy a book from her basically Mm -hmm. and she walked with me the whole time and at one point I slipped and she dragged me up by the the collar and stopped me falling (laughs) you know and at the end she just wanted me to buy a book so she could feed her family like it was just such an amazing experience but most breathtaking thing I think I've ever done Mm. at any you know at, at any time in my life. What I'm getting out of the story thus far is your real DIY approach to things you seem to just make things happen from nothing so when you created the studio um that seemed to come via you know you developing a life in music did you have any training or did you just teach yourself how to produce records? No, at that point I, I didn't have any training. I just had a good ear. And uh, and so 
what sort of evolved out of that was one of the large studios in Adelaide, um, Hippo Audio it was called at the time. I was asked to go and play on an album down there. And as most people with studios do, you usually take a bit of a sample of some of the work that you've done. I went down there, played on the on the album and the, the engineer said to me, oh, so you do a bit of recording I hear and, you know, I said, yeah, yeah, here's some of the stuff. You know, we just sort of had a listen and he listened to it and he said to me, what sort of gear have you got? And I said, oh, I've just, you know, got this basic little setup and told him the, the equipment that I had and he turned around and he said, I, I don't believe that you can get that sound out of that gear. Can I come to your house and have a look? I said, sure, come and have a look. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and then it was at that moment that he said, uh, I want you to work for me when you're not on the road. And I'm like, this is absolute uh, dream come true because really when it comes to being in a studio, being at, at Hippo, was it's a huge studio with a, a massive console that had all these moving faders and all sorts of stuff and it was like, you know, it was like a kid in a candy shop. And But what that did was was by me doing that, I actually learnt a lot uh, in, in terms of the engineering side. So the, the sort of the more science of it, I, I learned how to break rules. Uh, and, and fortunately, my, my guy that was the owner of the place, he was one that was really open to, to just changing the game, you know. And so that meant that we could be really, really creative. You know, we, we were using Piccadilly water bottles, you know, the great big 20-litre things, mm-hmm. hitting them with, a, with our elbow with, a, with a, a jumper on so that it would just make this deep thud through mm-hmm. the spout and we'd put that in the microphone and that would be the sound we use for the kick drum. You know, stuff wow. like that and, you know, emptying cutlery drawers on the on the tiled floors just to get a sound effect and things like that. It was just, it was just fantastic. And these, this was the days prior to computers too. Wow. And so this is, um, I mean, that's innovation at its rawest possible level. Well, I mean, it's, I, I, yeah, I call it creativity. You mm-hmm. know, when, it, when you're putting something like that, a noise like that into a piece of music, that's uh, – I think that's pretty special. Absolutely. What was the next step from there? So I was still touring and I was working at Hippo. Um, One of the clients that I had in my home studio was uh, a guy that did VHS duplication. He had a company called City Dub. And within that company, they they also had a video editing suite. Mm -hmm. And I kind of looked at that and and thought to myself, well, nobody's really brought video and audio together in such a way that, that it, it sort of has a seamless operation. I said, maybe I could look at, and he told me he was selling his company and maybe I could look at buying it and see, you know, so what I can make of it, move the studio into the city, make it bigger, blah, blah, blah. Worked out that, yeah, all worked out and I could buy it and bought the company and uh, built the studio, moved it into the city. And um, and then, you know, we, we turned over a $600,000 business into $1.3 million in the first 18 months just simply because... We had some energy and drive and, you know, we're doing 800,000 VHS tapes a year and all this sort of stuff, employing 14 people. So I went from being a, you know, pretty f- free-loving musician in a band mm-hmm. to employing 14 people and uh, and making th- quite a successful little little company that still exists today. What was the biggest challenge going from being a musician to a business owner? Probably giving up being in front of people on the stage. I think probably was one of the biggest sacrifices that I, I had to make. Not that I'm unhappy that I had to make that sacrifice because I, I kind of was at a point where I thought I can't keep going, you know, through to my 30s and 40, late 30s and 40s, you know, being on a stage trying to entertain people and, and you know, out so late at night and up so early in the morning and all sorts of stuff. So I just, I just thought I needed something more. I needed something else to take me past the playing and singing. I, was, I, I guess I was trying to look at ways to evolve my career beyond that. Mm-hmm. But I suppose, you know, others have proven that you can do that sort of into your older years. You take a look at people like the Rolling Stones yeah. and, you know, acts of that kind. Was there something that was part of this owning a business and sort of really being master of your own destiny that had you go, you know what, I could make a fist of this and this could be fulfilling? Yeah, oh, absolutely. It definitely was. And, and I, I certainly felt like a master of my own destiny. Mm. Uh, I thought at that time that, you know, I was – buying a business and building a business that was going to be for the rest of my life. I didn't think I was ever going to sh- change from it because I loved it and I, n- I just didn't get out of bed thinking that I was going to work. I was just going to my passion mm-hmm. and often that meant that, you know, I, my, I was at my passion till 10, 12 at night too mm-hmm. because, you know, when, you, when you're producing people's records and, and that sort of thing, it's just, uh, yeah, it's pretty crazy. Mm. Uh, tell me about some of those recording experiences. Is there anyone of note that you ever recorded? Yeah, there's look, there's quite a few, um, but probably the 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 most dramatic was when I 
recorded this young fella. He he came into the studio. He was a bushy haired guy, fourteen years old, mm-hmm. never been in the studio before, and uh, because of the experience that I've had previously with with working with kids. Uh, I would record everything. So I before he came, I'd set all the, all of the the stuff up. He was coming in to sing, so I'd set everything up, the headphones for him to, when he walked into the studio. And for those of you that don't know the the recording process, you put all the music instruments down first individually, and then you lay the vocals in on top. So we were at that stage where we were laying the vocals in, and this little kid walked into the studio, and so I had a quick g'day, how you going, and then put him into the booth set up the microphone, put the headphones on. I said, oh, I'm just going to play it through. I want you to sing along with it just so that you can get it used to what it feels like and all that sort of stuff. And uh, he sang and I just couldn't believe what I was hearing back. It was just absolutely like something beyond belief. And uh, when he'd finished, I'd just called him into the vocal booth. And, th- and this studio was uh, – sorry, into the control room. And this studio was quite big. It had a large control room and you could walk out one side of it and walk right around the hallway and then come back in the other end. So when he walked in – I grabbed the stress ball. I had a hippo stress ball on the on the desk, and I threw it down on the desk. And I said, "It's because of guys like you that I'm never going to sing again." And I <laughs> bolted out and walked around. And it was taking t- 20, 20 seconds or something to walk around and come back in the other side. And the poor kid had this horrified look on his face. And um, and I said to him, "That was the most insane singing that I'd ever heard." And that. Um, uh, you know, that if he wanted to do another take, he could, but would he like to listen to what he just recorded? And he said, oh, no, I think we can do another one. So he did another one. And we used two lines out of the second take and used the whole warm-up take as his, his final on the on the record. And that young fella went on to win the first Australian Idol, young guy Sebastian. Wow. And what an accomplished, you know, musician he is now. Yeah, oh, just incredible. And he still remembers that time. I saw him only a year ago and he, he just, yeah poured his heart out and said, how you going? And just remembers that experience like it was yesterday. It's Fantastic. Pretty... Now, obviously, you're not doing that now, mm. but you've run venues, you've done all, you know, like I said, we met when you were at Music SA, you've done all sorts of things since then. Yeah, look, I mean, I guess, again, going back to wanting to stay within the music industry, you know, uh, across the board was was probably what drove me to all of the different things I've done. So, yeah, you're right. I mean, I sold out of the studio and and that was at a time when I just I just needed to get some clear headspace, thinking that I was never going to get back into music again, even though I knew I would. Uh, within four weeks, I was then programming the music at a venue. Uh, that then turned into me managing that venue, which was really good because it got me to understand the business side behind the venue. You know, as a band, you go in thinking that they're making an absolute bucket load of money for the drinks that they sell for, because they have, you know, high prices or whatever. But that's actually not the case. You know, when you think about the refrigeration, the rent, the light, the power, all of those things, the glasses, you know, the amount of glasses that get smashed, you know, all that stuff. You actually then understand how little venues actually make out of the alcohol sales and it's the food and the other things that the add-ons that they make. And so while I was learning about that, you know, we were very involved at at the time with that venue with the Fringe and we were doing 70 to 90 Fringe shows over the four weeks of the Adelaide Fringe and, and so that was just nuts. But it was like Christmas, you know, really for the venue it was the the best period of revenue for the whole year and um i came up with this stupid idea to uh, turn an abandoned bus station into a fringe venue which is dedicated to live music back in 2012 everyone thought i was dreaming but i did it and in 13 the depot happened and uh uh, and then, you know, we had 58,000 people through. We did 70 shows there, 90 shows in at the Promethean, which was the venue. And I played in eight as well that year and uh, got exhausted. And that's when the opportunity to work with Music SA came because I think um, some of the work that I'd done with, with council and, and, uh, and the government and so forth just sort of, I guess, flagged a bit of attention. And, uh, and I was actually previous to that. I was on the board of Music SA anyway, so... I was able to, to to jump into the role. Now, before we um, go down that path, tell people about the depot and what it actually was. What period of time was it on? How many hours was put in? And what was the concept of the depot? Well, I guess where it came, where it started was um, we we have a, a bus terminal where all of the interstate buses come into Adelaide, and you know you're coming in from Sydney or Melbourne, you get off at the bus terminal, and you look out on this eyesore of a building, which was the old bus sta- the station. And uh, they had all the cyclone fencing around it. And I was actually really embarrassed by that because I'm really proud of my city. And so 
I wondered what I could do to, to reinvigorate that space. And so I went to the council and because I was fairly connected within the council at that point and just asked them, you know, what was earmarked for the, the venue, the, for that place. And they said, well, it was going to be redeveloped at some point, but at this stage there was nothing. And I just flagged with them the idea of, well, what if we could turn this into a into a festival venue for the four weeks of the Adelaide Fringe from uh, middle of Feb to mid-March and 13 and just, you know, create something out of that space to make it feel like when people come in, there's some energy in the city. It took a long, long time to get through, but then the vision for it was really to have a place where families could come during the day and adults could come through during the night to have food, vendors, massive bar. We put on, um, like I said, 70 music performances there. It was the first time the Adelaide Fringe ever had a music section in the Fringe Guide because there was that much going on, um, which was, you know, I guess I suppose a, a fairly pioneering thing because from every year from then on in it's it's happened. And, you know, I guess what we wanted to do is get some named artists. We wanted to put on parties in the shed where basically, you know, people could go and get painted with fluorescent paint, put on a onesie and you go in and at midnight you squirt yourself with a fluorescent <laughs> bottle. And uh, we sold those things out. We, we were putting on one thinking we'd sell it out, but, you know, that sold out in 45 minutes. So we put on a second one in the second week. That sold out in three minutes. And the third one that we put on sold out in 45 seconds. Whoa. It was just ridiculous. And there was like a thousand people in this in this shed. And because it was this old abandoned sort of building, we'd sort of attenuated it with all this old building materials and insulation and fishing nets and stuff and made it look pretty cool. And we lined the site with containers, shipping containers. And then, you know, I guess the whole thing was really just to, to create an inner city vibe that was different to what was over the other side of town on the east end where the the garden of unearthly delights resides and and those sorts of things so it um it was yeah it was a really really exciting time and and just to be able to negotiate it deliver it and and then live through <laughs> live through it was crazy we we did a kids fringe program as well during the day through the middle two weeks and yeah it was uh, it was nuts i feel exhausted just hearing about it <laughs> So there you were thinking that um, you were going to be a signed artist in your early years. You ended up in a cover band. You found yourself working in music production. You then, you know, have developed this new, uh, you know, concept as part of an arts festival. And then next you were at the helm of a, a music arts organisation. Yeah, I mean, I kind of never really dreamt that I'd get to that point. But because I was passionate about giving back to the industry that had served me so well, it seemed like a logical next step for me. And I, at that point, never worked in a non-profit, no, not-for-profit sector. I'd only ever worked in the for-profit. So I figured I was going to pick up some pretty significant experiences through that. So as a result of that, then um, it introduced me into a whole different level of bureaucracy. So, you know, where I was dealing with sort of fairly low-level people within councils and and uh, and government i moved up into sort of like the higher level uh, of of people and even in some cases the premier and mm-hmm. and the lord mayor so the real decision makers <laughs> yeah 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 so it's uh, it was a real it was it was ab- absolutely pivotal for me to to get into that network of people because what that opened for me was a whole new area of of thinking that i think probably without thinking about it i was doing but to actually understand that I was doing it was probably what what sort of that year at Music SA really taught me. It would have been around that time that, um, you know, Adelaide and the, the government was really starting to look at themselves as being a hub for innovation. Mm. And and also music at the same time. So mm. so the, the Premier was also the Arts Minister, so we got a fair bit of... Uh, kudos through government, through through the Premier, which was really, really good and, and some new funding models opened up and the St Paul's Creative Centre opened up. And so, yeah, it was really, really interesting because when when uh, when we started to talk to the Department of Innovation, which was called Department for Manufacturing Innovation, no, Department for Mining Innovation Resources and Energy or something like that, DEMITA it was called, when we were talking to those people, they were looking at how they could apply an industrial lens across the music industry because they saw it as an industry that the Premier was passionate about. So how can we make more of an industrial view on this? Uh, and it was at that point that the government said to me, would you be interested in looking at formal cluster program for, for the music industry? And a, a cluster is you know, in traditional industries, it's it's really all about pulling people together to go and bid for high value contracts overseas. So, for example, if we if we're looking for uh, submarines and we want to, you know, a bid for all this work that's going on overseas, so 
four or five or six or ten companies come together and they organise themselves of who, who can do what at, at what skill level and therefore then they can put in a cost-effective bid because, you know, they're not all trying to do the same thing uh, and then turn around and then bid for that work and win it and therefore it's jobs for South Australia and all that sort of thing. So when we started to talk about that, um, I got really excited about the opportunities there for music and technology because what I thought was was that at the time, three, four years ago, Spotify was the enemy. You know, Spotify is a beautiful platform that, that actually is, is starting to pay the artists really, really well. Um, but at the time it was seen as just such disruption that it was just going to devastate and completely, you know, eliminate the music industry. Looking at how music and technology could come together was something that really excited me and uh, and it was something that I was, you know, reasonably sort of a fay with because of the experiences that I had and that sort of thing. So, um, yeah, the government came to me and asked if, if I'd look at the clustering model and I put my hand up and we formed a not-for-profit organisation called Musitech and then we sought out opportunities all around the world that we could use locals to, to come together to fulfil. Tell me about some of the exciting work that you were doing as part of Musitech. I think probably the the most exciting part was the uh, being able to spin out eight different companies that are that are still in different levels of development right now. Um, one has just launched not long ago, um, Wandering Sound, who we interviewed last year. Yeah. You know, releasing somebody's album on their app, and and that started out of an innovation challenge that we put out every year. So seeing those sort of companies and being involved with those companies and, and helping with them and how they develop and grow, um, I think one of the other things that was probably I'm most proud of is is the fact that we were able to strike up a, an MOU with the Berklee College of Music based in Boston to look at how we could explore, get students from Adelaide and students from Berkeley to explore the intersection of music and health and technology and look at how we can create better ways of life through, you know, things like, you know, being able to provide a, a, a clarinet that has sensors in it that, um, you know, helps kids with asthma and stuff like that. So mm -hmm. there was all sorts of different things that we'd, we'd explored and, and were exploring doing, but that needed some further funding to to get it off the ground and uh, and that's still sitting there um the relationship hasn't gone away by any stretch of the imagination it's uh, it's certainly still there uh it's just now waiting for the right people to come along to help us make that happen fantastic what else are you involved in because you're never a person that just does one thing at a time so I've uh, I've got a startup of my own uh, called Cognolytics, and we're working in Internet of Things, which uh, which is really really exciting. Um, it's it's something that um, that I guess has has been a buzzword for a little while, and I've been hearing lots and lots and lots about it. But actually, looking at uh, sensor technology and how we can use that around cities, which is uh, which is really exciting. Um, obviously, we've got the In Show podcast, which I absolutely love, and uh, and there's many many other projects that uh, that we've got working at the moment and you know looking at how we can uh, we can teach people how to podcast and uh, and do other things like that well thanks so much for sharing uh, everything with me david i knew some of that but it was great to hear it from a slightly different perspective in a new context i've got to say you know it's been extraordinary to think where you began and what you're doing now but then to look at some of the common threads that we've seen through your life and that's you know so much a part of the interviews that we've done in 2017 where people start somewhere but in somewhere completely differently but you can really sense that the passion has always been there and sometimes it just sort of raises its head other times it's just it's a bit hidden from view and then all of a sudden there are those moments when things start gelling and uh, and great things start happening for people yeah it's really interesting because you know often when you look back at your journey and you think you know I learned all these different things along the way but there's never seems to be a moment that they all culminate in one place. Mm -hmm. And often when they start to is the, the time where it's just so, you know, it's enriching and exciting. Absolutely. For more in innovation, you can subscribe to the In Show podcast and we're on Facebook and Twitter as well. Tomorrow we find out what's in from one of our favourite interviews of 2017. We're speaking with Frank Falco. Now, he's the co-founder of a blockchain factory, which is founded by a group of professionals with experience in cryptocurrency and blockchain technology. Now, what's in for him is sure to be something really worth listening to. Yeah, and no doubt in this field, I would expect, although you never can tell when we ask people what's in. Sometimes they break well outside of their own industry. We'll find out what Frank has got to say tomorrow on the InShow podcast. The InShow interview. Subscribe to the InShow podcast on iTunes. A Dave and the Beanstalk production.
Love this podcast? Support it and sponsor today. Simply head to oscastnetwork.com for details.